This photograph was taken by a local San Diego photographer named Hans Wendt on September 25, 1978, exactly 43 years before the publication of this video. Little did Mr. Wendt know that this would become the most sought after photograph he would ever take. It depicts a Boeing 727 just seconds before it crashed into a San Diego suburb killing 144 people. The photograph featuring the specific Southwest Airlines plane's wing in flames led many to wonder what had happened to cause such a disaster on what was otherwise an ordinary September day. To understand the scope of the disaster, we need to know what happened in the seconds just before this photograph was taken. Pacific Southwest Airlines Flight 182 was the regular morning flight between the Californian cities of Sacramento and San Diego. Operated by the then modern Boeing 727, the flight would make a stopover in Los Angeles before it would continue on for the short leg to San Diego. Introduced in 1964, the Boeing 727 was one of the most successful planes of its day. Boeing built over 1,800 planes of this type across different variants. The aircraft was produced all the way up until 1984, with the 200 variant being by far the most popular variant. In total, Pacific Southwest Airlines operated 51 Boeing 727s. On the morning of September 25, 1978, this Boeing 727 registered as November 533 Papa Sierra would make its final flight. The first leg of the trip to Los Angeles was performed with nothing amiss. The flight between Los Angeles and San Diego is rather short, with the distance between the two airports being around 110 miles. The Boeing 727 left LAX at 8.34 in the morning, with 128 passengers and 7 crew members on board. At the flight controls were 3 members of flight crew. Captain James McFerrin, age 42, was the pilot not flying and was handling radio communications. The plane was being flown by his first officer Robert Fox, age 38. Behind these two was the flight engineer. Martin Wayne, age 44, was sat monitoring the aircraft systems. In the cabin were four flight attendants attending to the passengers. Among the passengers were 29 PSA employees. They were expected to land at San Diego's airport later that morning with clear weather conditions. In analyzing the events of that day, we should turn our attention away from the Boeing 727 and instead look at a completely different plane. This takes us to Montgomery Field, a small general aviation airport located in San Diego. This airport sits a few miles northeast of the main San Diego airport. At Montgomery Field that morning, a Cessna 172 was preparing for takeoff being flown by two privately licensed pilots, Martin Casey, age 32, and David Boswell, age 35. Casey's qualifications included a multi-engine and instrument rating. As for Boswell, Although he possessed a commercial pilot's license, he did not have an instrument rating. The purpose of this flight was for him to obtain more hours practicing instrument flying mainly in the area of instrument approaches and the use of the instrument landing system. These approaches were to be made at San Diego's Lindbergh Field Airport, the main airport in San Diego. This was due to the lack of instrument equipment at local airfields. At the time in 1978, to aid in the training of instrument flying when there were clear skies outside, Boswell would be wearing a visor device that would deliberately obstruct his vision so he could only feasibly see the aircraft's instruments. Sometimes referred to as a training hood or just hood, this practice would come under scrutiny because of the events which transpired that morning. The pilots of the Cessna plane left Montgomery Field at around quarter past eight in the morning for their instrument practice session at Lindbergh Field. That morning, the active arriving and departing runway was runway 27, the west-facing runway. The Cessna pilots, as the wind happened to be calm that morning, would be flying ILS approaches on runway 09, the east-facing direction. During this time, the Cessna plane was in airspace managed by an approach controller at San Diego, aside from the times where the plane performed the ILS approaches, where the Cessna was handed off to a tower controller. The time was now approaching 9 a.m., at 7.58, the Cessna flew its second ILS approach onto runway 09, while the pilot flying under the training hood then flew the plane northeast on a climb out of the airport in a go-around maneuver. The controller cleared the Cessna to maintain VFR flight. 
The VFR conditions, as stated by the controller, was made so that the Cessna needed to stay below 3,500 feet. The instruction to turn to a heading of 070 was also made. Meanwhile, on the Boeing 727, the flight crew of Flight 182 had been making their preparations for landing at San Diego. They had descended down to 11,000 feet when they contacted San Diego Approach at 8.53, four minutes before the Cessna plane would arrive back on the same frequency. At 8.57, the instruction for Flight 182 to descend further was given, down to 7,000 feet. The controller also asked if the flight crew had visual contact with the airport, to which they also confirmed. With this information, the controller gave clearance for a visual approach onto runway 27. To make this approach, Flight 182 intercepted the ground-based navigational vortex in Mission Bay to fly an outbound radial of 090. This would lead the Boeing 727 to fly parallel to the runway. With the appropriate distancing, First Officer Robert Fox, the pilot flying, would then turn to line up with runway 27 to land like he would have done numerous times prior to this. At 8.59, the controller notified Flight 182 of traffic in the area at their 12 o'clock position. This was then followed up quickly with a notification to look out for additional traffic, this being the small Cessna plane. The PSA flight crew replied that they were looking out for the Cessna. The 727 had entered the downwind leg on its approach to the runway heading east on a heading of 090. The Cessna had also made a deviation and made a turn to the right onto roughly the same heading. The approach controller had said to Flight 182 that the Cessna was just north of the airport in their area and was under visual flight rules VFR. The controller would give an update on the Cessna's position relative to the 727s, about 3 miles ahead of them. Though the PSA crew initially said that they had spotted the plane, it had become apparent according to the cockpit voice recorder transcript that the Cessna was no longer in sight. In fact, the flight crew had begun speculating on that plane's position relative to theirs. Having been asked to maintain visual separation, the PSA pilots believed that they had actually passed the Cessna plane. In reality, the Cessna had entered a blind spot from the view of the pilots and was actually slightly below the 727, but still directly in front of them. They would never notify the controller that they had lost visual contact with the Cessna. The National Transportation Safety Board also made note that the Cessna may have been exceedingly difficult to spot in this scenario. The Cessna was painted yellow and may have blended into the various colors of the suburban area below. The NTSB also carried out an experiment which determined that for a period of 80 seconds, the Cessna could have been seen on the center sections of the 727's windshield directly in front of the plane. Afterward, the plane would have fell to the lower portions of the windshield as the 727 caught up with the Cessna. However, could the pilots inside of the Cessna plane have seen the 727? The Cessna 172 allows for the occupants to have a very good field of view even behind. However, the investigation determined that they would have only have had a window of 10 seconds to notice the plane prior to the flight's final 90 seconds. The approach controller received a conflict notice on their equipment, indicating that the two planes were closing in dangerously close. The controller did not follow through on this alert because the alert was common at the airport, according to them, even sounding when there was no real threat of a conflict. They did, however, say to the Cessna that traffic was in the area and that, quote, a PSA jet has you in sight. The transmission was not acknowledged. The two planes collided at 9.01 and 47 seconds. The right wing of the Boeing 727 clipped the Cessna from behind as it descended in a small bank to the right, colliding at an altitude of 2,600 feet. The right wing of the 727 struck the Cessna which then tumbled from the sky. The majority of the small plane came down towards the east end of Polk Avenue. As for the Boeing 727 after the collision, the plane began banking over to the right, effectively losing the use of a wing. The plane was left uncontrollable. There was nothing the pilots could do to save their aircraft as it began plummeting to the ground. A pilot of another plane in the area in a Beechcraft Baron saw the plane go down and noted the fumes trailing from the plane's damaged wing. It was during these few seconds as the plane was going down that Hans Wendt took this photograph. The plane crashed around 3 miles north of San Diego's Lindbergh Field Airport. Flight 182 crashed into the residential suburb of North Park. 
The 727 struck the top of the house located at 3611 Nile Street. The plane hit the ground in a nose-down position banked over to the right at 50 degrees, crashing just west of the Interstate 805 freeway. All 144 people on board Flight 182 were killed, as were the two pilots in the Cessna aircraft. There were also a further seven fatalities and nine injuries on the ground. This disaster became the deadliest air accident to occur in the United States at that time, only surpassed one year later by the crash of American Airlines Flight 191. Following the investigation led by the National Transportation Safety Board, it was recommended that a terminal radar service area be implemented around the airport in San Diego. Other airports had already been equipped with these radar services. A new classification of airspace was introduced in this area, which has the strictest airspace rules in the United States. The nearby smaller airports were also equipped with instrument landing systems to allow pilots to train at local airfields instead of international airports. The NTSB had calculated that if the Cessna plane stuck to its assigned heading by ATC instead of making its deviating turn, the two planes would have missed each other. The NTSB also noted that it was the responsibility of the PSA crew to comply with standards for overtaking giving appropriate spacing for the Cessna plane. There has never been another plane crash in the San Diego area since. That would be the end of it. However, in 1986, a near identical accident would occur over Los Angeles. A small Piper plane collided with an Aeromexico DC-9. Both planes crashed, with the DC-9 crashing into a residential area much like that of the PSA incident. That disaster killed 82 people. Following this, TCAS was introduced, the Traffic Collision Avoidance System. However, as discussed on this channel before, despite this advancement in technology, mid-air collisions have still occurred. Hello everyone, I hope you are having a great day. Thank you so much for watching this video through to the end, I really appreciate it. If you found this video interesting, I personally am very happy with how this video turned out. Be sure to subscribe as there is a new video every Saturday. Speaking of videos, next week I will be using a new flight simulator add-on for the videos with a plane that I have been wanting to try out for a long time. With that, I am producing a video on a topic I have wanted to do for a while now and I can't wait for you to see it next week. Anyway, it is that time of the week where I need to thank my patrons for their incredible support. If you would like to have your name featured here or read out at the end of the next video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. And the option to opt out of that as well if you still wish to join is available, just send me a message on there. You'll also get access to all new videos and I'm looking forward to October being a heavy hitting month for content. A thank you to my £5 patrons, Avery Tioda, Aaron Wilson, Hector Palmatellas, Ken Zachman, Christy, Leon San Jennings, Murray Ennis, MG, Pacman 7, Panic Chicken, Pedro Cruz, who is a new joiner, Rebecca Rivers, Saria Melody, Sleepy, So FP, and Sue So Sue Shoes. A big thanks to my generous 10 pound tier patrons Aidan Montgomery, Alex, Anne Sid, Daniel Hendricks, Derek Bean, Karma, Mike Milton, Side Effect, Roger Mayer, and Where Are My Cheetos, everyone's favorite Patreon name. Thank you so much for watching and for your support. That's it from me this week. Have a great weekend and I will see you next time. Goodbye.